a few ways that you can ask questions and I'm going to be asking questions. Want, I want y'all's participation as well. Um, you can have your student come up to the front in front of the camera and talk through the microphone that way, or I just figured out how to open up the chat. Um, so if you want to put it in the chat, then we can address it that way as well. Uh, whatever works easiest for y'all. I'll go ahead and share my screen. We are going to be talking about Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears today. Anytime we talk about the Trail of Tears here at the Hermitage, we start off by talking about a really important historical event that takes place in 1829. Uh, some people say that it's even one of the most important historical events in American history, but not many people really know about it. It was actually America's first gold rush. A lot of times we think about the gold rush in California that doesn't happen uh, for many years later, but we actually have our first gold rush in Georgia. And it's kind of right in this area here in a town called Dahlonega or Cherokee Nation, because it is Cherokee land at the time, would call it Talonica. Now, Talonica is Cherokee for yellow money. So given the name yellow money, you can probably assume that Native Americans knew that there was gold there, right? Well, a white settler comes in, he finds a gold nugget about the size of an adult fist. And because this guy is much like me and can't really keep a secret, uh, he goes around telling everybody about this gold that he found. And then white settlers start coming in and they start mining for that gold. The problem with this is that mining for gold is a very dirty process. You have to take mud and dirt in a bucket. You have to sift it through the water, send all that mud and that dirt down the river. It was choking out streams and rivers, and it was uh, destroying entire villages and killing off wildlife. So Cherokee Nation went to the governor of Georgia, Governor Lumpkin, and they asked him to stop mining for gold. But Governor Lumpkin didn't really care, and he didn't listen. So Cherokee Nation takes it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rules that what Georgia is doing is unconstitutional, and they need to stop. But what do y'all think Governor Lumpkin said? He said he doesn't really care, right? Because at the time, states had more power than the federal government. If the federal government created a law, they didn't really have to listen to it. So Governor Lumpkin does this, and he actually takes it a step further. He says that Cherokee Nation is no longer allowed to hold any tribal meetings. They're no longer allowed to have any business dealings with white Americans, and they have no rights to their land. So he goes directly against the advice of the Supreme Court, and he continues um, to really just kind of take over that Cherokee land and take advantage of them. The federal government knows that they need to do something to step in. At the time, Georgia territory went all the way out uh, to the Mississippi River. It took up states that we know today as Mississippi and Alabama. So the federal government said, if you Give us that land so that we can create those states. We will remove Native Americans from Georgia, send them west to those lands. Uh, <laughs> you can take that land. Let me just, here we go. Andrew Jackson was not the first president to talk about Indian removal. It actually goes as far back as our first president, George Washington. He says, if Native Americans could just assimilate to white culture, then everything would be perfectly fine. Now, in order to assimilate to white culture, the root word of that is similar. So they have to look like, act like, and be similar to white Americans. Now, this is where I want y'all's participation and discussion. Uh, raise your hand, put it in the chat, or come up to the front uh, and tell me what some things Native Americans would have to give up in order to assimilate to white culture. All right, how about Eugene Ware? I saw him get up first. We, to assimilate, to, to assimilate, mm, I can't say that word, to the culture, we, they have to change their religion, change everything about them practically, change how they go, like how they travel, how they, well, I know how they travel. Sometimes they have to change building processes too. 
right? So uh, Eugene Ware and Alfred Elementary also said uh, religious beliefs, right? That's going to be a huge one because these Native American nations, they have their own religious beliefs. They're going to have to give that up, convert to Christianity in order to assimilate to white culture. Uh, what else? I saw somebody from South Creek. Did you give up? Or did was that your answer? That was your answer. What else? Religious beliefs? All right, South Creek. Uh, they might have to give up some of their land. They don't necessarily have to give up their land, but if they don't assimilate, then they will be removed from their land. So what do they have to give up in order to assimilate? Their religion? What else? Work practices, so, uh, Corpus Christi, yeah, they're going to have to give up some of those just kind of everyday work practices. All right, South Creek. They would have to give up practically their entire culture, their history, their... Right? Um, their, their celebrations, it would just all... Yeah, gone. pretty much their whole way of life, their celebrations, their, their practices. Alfred said what they wear. Absolutely, right? So you see George Washington here. They're going to have to dress like this man. Um, and we'll see examples of that a little bit later on as well. These are all correct answers, right? They've got to give up their religion, uh, the way they dress, the way they really just kind of live their life from day to day. They're also going to have to give up their language. We're going to be talking about, and I'm going to say the five major nations of the Southeast quite a bit throughout this presentation. Each of those five major nations has their own language. They're going to have to give that up. They're going to have to learn how to read and write and speak in English. So George Washington says, if they can give up all of this, everything about themselves, everything would be perfectly fine. But if not, we're going to have to remove them from their land. We don't really talk about John Adams too much because he kind of follows the same trajectory as George Washington. He doesn't really do a lot of things different. But Thomas Jefferson, he takes it a step further. He says, yes, if Native Americans can assimilate to white culture, then everything would be perfectly fine. But if not, we need to remove them, but we need to remove them even further. We need to send them as far west as the Rocky Mountains. And in Thomas Jefferson's own language, he says part of the reason for purchasing that Louisiana territory, that Louisiana purchase that we learned so much about, is to remove Native Americans as far west as the Rocky Mountains. Henry Clay, he never officially becomes president. He runs against Jackson a few times. He takes it even further. In a direct quote from Henry Clay, he says, these Indian savages could never assimilate to white culture and their disappearance from the human race would be no great loss to the world. So what is Henry Clay saying? What do you think his approach is going to be? I see a hand in South Creek. Uh, to kill all Native Americans? Yeah, that's exactly what his approach is going to be, right? He says we should just kill the Native Americans and take their land that way. We show you this because these are three different approaches even before Jackson enters the scene. So George Washington says we need to remove them west to Mississippi and Alabama. Thomas Jefferson says we need to remove them as far west as the Rocky Mountains. And Henry Clay says we need to just remove them all together. Then Andrew Jackson becomes president. Uh, this is Andrew Jackson here. This is what many Americans would see in the newspaper after Jackson gets elected president. You can tell he's got his military service, he's ready to go to battle, and he looks pretty brave and courageous, right? His face doesn't look scared. He's ready to face whatever conflict might arise. This is a quote from Jackson's inaugural address. He says, it will be my sincere and constant desire to observe toward the Indian tribes within our limits a just and liberal policy, and to give that humane and considered attention to their rights and their wants which is consistent with the habits of the government and the feelings of our people. So this sounds pretty good, right? If you look at it closely, he says sincere and constant desire. He didn't just think about it right now. He's been thinking about it for a while. He wants to observe within our limits. This is very important because the only time our nation has ever been debt-free 
was in 1835 when Andrew Jackson was president. He pays off our nation's debt. He's not going to bankrupt our country, but he's going to do whatever he can within our limits to observe a just, meaning what's fair, meaning what's right, and liberal, meaning he's going to be very generous. Because he wants to give that humane, take the E off of humane, you get human, right? He's going to treat them like human beings. And he's going to give considerate attention to not only their rights, because he thinks as humans, they have inalienable rights, right? U.S. citizen, that's what our country is founded on, is we have inalienable rights. But he's also going to give them everything that they want within our limit. Because he thinks it's consistent with the habits of our government and the feelings of our people. Going all the way back to the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, our country is founded on this. And he thinks all Americans can get on board. So this sounds really good, right? But keep this date in mind, March 4th, 1829. Less than a year later, in January 1830, this is what Jackson says to Congress. He wants to end conflict between state and federal government, right? Georgia is not listening to the federal government, not listening to the Supreme Court. He wants to end that, give the federal government a little bit more power. He wants a place for the dense and civilized population to expand. The dense and civilized population are white Americans. Dense meaning we're overcrowded, we're overpopulated on the eastern seaboard, we need a place to expand. He wants to strengthen the southwestern frontier. As we continue to go west, he's going to send Native Americans west to be our first line of defense. He wants to relieve Mississippi and Alabama of Indian occupancy, right? As they got removed from Georgia, Native Americans got put in Mississippi and Alabama. He wants to remove them from those states and send them further west so we can settle those states. Wants to separate Indians from immediate contact with whites. Anywhere there's contact between the two, there's conflict. So he wants to end that contact altogether. Freeze the Indians from the power of the states. Georgia's taking advantage of Cherokee Nation. He wants to put a stop to that. And then this last one kind of makes me really mad. He says it will help preserve their heritage and traditions. Native American heritage and traditions are very closely tied to their land. Cherokee Nation specifically, they believe that the West brought death, right? Because as you look at the sun, as the sun goes West, it sets, it dies every day. So even before Indian removal, they believe that the West brought death. So by sending them west, you're really sending them to their death sentence in their belief. So this one makes me mad because I don't know if Jackson didn't know their heritage and traditions or if he did and just didn't care. But by removing them from their land, he's actually stripping them of both of those things. Does that make sense? So does this sound similar or different to this? And why? We got one from Eugene Ware. Corpus Christi says very different, yeah. Um, I think that it's different because I feel like the first one, um, it's a little bit more limited to the second one and the second one, they have more, um, they have more things that they're freeing them from. Right, so, very different, right? How about South Creek? I saw y'all get up next. I feel like it was different the first one, he was trying to protect their rights, and the second one, he's just sending them away. Right? The first one, it sounds like he's protecting their rights. The second one, it sounds like he's just sending them away. How about Alfred Elementary? he'll give them all they need and they can stay in their land. Well, in the second one, it sounds like he's taking away their history instead of preserving. Right, the first one sounds like he's gonna give them everything they need, everything they need, they can stay on their land. Second one, he's kind of taking away their history. Absolutely, these are all really good responses. Now, what happens in 1829 to make Andrew Jackson change his mind? How about Paradise Elementary? Uh, the wants of land and what and the resources that are on land. 
right? The land and the resources that are on the land. Remember what I said at the beginning? In 1829, they found gold in Georgia. Now Jackson's changing his mind, right? Maybe that has something to do with it. Now he wants that land. That land becomes more valuable. Why else do you think Jackson's going to be changing his mind here? Why do you think those two things are very different? Do I see a hand at Alfred? No. Yeah. In Georgia. Georgia, there's gold, and in the and in the West, there isn't. Right. They know that there is gold in Georgia. There might not be gold in the West, so maybe send them out there because it's less valuable. Absolutely. Another reason why Jackson might be changing his mind here is because in here, this is a speech where Jackson wants you to get on his side, right? Whenever a politician is making a speech, they're going to say whatever they think you want to hear so you can get on board with them, and it might not always match up with what their policies are. So Jackson's trying to be politically correct here. He's trying to get you on his side. Here, he's just doing what he thinks he has to do. This is Elias Boudinot. Elias Boudinot was a Cherokee man. Um, but by looking at this picture, by looking at his life, he had really assimilated to white culture, right? Looking at his clothes, the way he does his hair, those are assimilation features. He gets a degree from an Ivy League university in New England, and even his name, Elias Boudinot, is a French name. He adopts the name of the family that takes him in while he's going to college. He had done everything he could to assimilate to white culture. He publishes a newspaper called the Cherokee Phoenix. This newspaper prints in both Cherokee and English languages, um, and it's just printing what's going on in Washington, D.C. at the time. There are no political opinions in this newspaper. He delivers it to everybody in Cherokee Nation free of charge because he wants them to stay in the loop of what's going on in politics. When Georgia militia caught wind of this, they went in, smashed his printing press, and burned the building to the ground. Elias Boudinot was eventually able to rebuild, and the Cherokee Phoenix is still in print today. This house belonged to a man named Joseph Van. Joseph Van was also a Cherokee man, uh, and he was a farmer, which in historical terms, a farmer just means they own zero to five enslaved people, and they're farming the land to provide for their family. They're not really making any money off of the land. Uh, Joseph Van had three enslaved people. Um, he's living in this brick mansion. Even looking at pictures of him, he had assimilated to white culture. He'd done everything he was told to do. When Indian removal went down, the local sheriff came in, removed Joseph Van and his family from the home, and sent them west. Then the sheriff moves his own family into that home. So it just goes to show you that even when people are doing everything that they're told to do, the government wasn't necessarily keeping up with their promises at this point. Um, so it just really shows you what these Native people are really going through at the time. We get Senate Bill 102, or the Indian Removal Act. It goes to Senate to be voted on. There are 24 states in the United States at the time, which means there's 48 senators, because there's two senators for every state. And this is what the map looks like. Red states mean both senators voted yes for Indian removal. Blue states mean both senators voted no for Indian removal. And the pink states mean that one senator voted yes and one voted no. What do you all notice about this map? Where do you see most of the red? How about Alfred Elementary? I see a few hands there. Um, it's like over like Louisiana, New York, and like near Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and right? Michigan. Absolutely. All right. How about uh, Stephanie, homeschool group? Oh, gosh. It's yeah. where the gold is. 
it's where the gold is, right? So you see it a lot in the South with Georgia um, and some of those other states. Uh, Corpus Christi says where most of the farming land is, South of Pennsylvania, absolutely. These all play very important roles, right? About South Creek, you had something to add? Um, most of the states in the North don't really think they should be removed. You see, you see a lot more blue up north, right? Not as much as we would like, but you definitely see all of the blue are in northern states. Um, this is all very important, right? Because in the south, that Indian conflict is in their backyard. So they want to get rid of that conflict. And by doing that, they feel like they need to get rid of the Native Americans on that land. Because when you end that contact, you end that conflict. Um, so that's why they would vote yes. They would also vote yes for that land, whether it be for gold, for farming, whatever. They want that land as well. Up north, they're not dealing with it on a daily basis, and they've already seen it happen. Because when we first arrived in the New World, we settled in New England, and the Native Americans that were already living there, because this place wasn't empty when we first arrived, they voluntarily left and went to Michigan. So if the people up north had studied their history, they would see the devastation that that brought. Do we have a question in Big Pine? Well, it's not really a question. It's that more of the red is in the um, slave states where the slaves were usually at and where the owners of the slaves were mainly at. Right. So you see a lot more red in the slave states. And this is also very important, too. It goes back to that farming aspect, right? Most of the states with farming land, because as America removes Native Americans from especially the deep south and Mississippi and Alabama, White settlers move in, start farming that land, and it increases the slave population in those states as well. Absolutely. Uh, we actually do a class that compares slavery and the Trail of Tears, so uh, really good comparison there. So Indian Removal Act passes in the Senate, and then it has to go to the House of Representatives to get voted on there. And this is what that map looks like. You see a little bit more blue than you did before, but still not as much as we would like to see. Louisiana is really the only split state, uh, and it switches from red. New York stays red. It's kind of the stronghold up north, but that's very important as well, because Martin Van Buren was a senator in New York. He was really good friends with Andrew Jackson. He actually goes on to become Jackson's vice president in his second term. So New York is going to vote for Jackson's bill because Jackson and Van Buren are such good friends. Um, it kind of just goes along uh, political and party lines there. This is Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett was a representative from Tennessee. Um, he actually had Jackson's seat in the House of Congress. So it was expected that he was going to vote for Jackson's bill. But he says, when the Indian Removal Act hit the floor, my colleagues surrounded me, told me this was a favorite measure of the president and I ought to go for it. But I could not in good conscience vote yes for Indian removal. They told me it would destroy my political career, but I would rather destroy my career and be morally correct than the other way around. So Davy Crockett votes no for Indian removal. It actually does destroy his political career. He doesn't get reelected to the House in Tennessee. He goes on to fight in the Alamo in Texas. He dies there, so it doesn't really work out well for him but he's still morally conscious, right? This picture here um, was published around the same time as the Indian Removal Act. The language that Jackson uses in the Indian Removal Act, he says it is his paternalistic duty. As the president of the United States, he acts as the father of the United States. So it is his paternalistic duty to care for the, uh, the people of this nation, just like a father would care for his son. So given that language, this artist publishes this picture in order to really mock Andrew Jackson. He's holding Native Americans in his arms like children. You see smaller Native Americans around his feet. It looks like he's taking care of them like a father. But we know that the artist is mocking Jackson because if you look in the uh, top right corner of that picture, that is Lady Liberty standing on the neck of a Native American. The artist is saying that their liberties are being stripped and that peace is gonna be broken. War is gonna break out, right? This is not a father taking care of his children. 
this is going to be devastating, and it is. All right. This here shows numbers of each state uh, and Native Americans that were removed from each state. You see a few of those New England states kind of combined together. There's a few things I want to point out here. Michigan, for instance, we never really talk about Michigan, but they have the most Native Americans removed from their state. Remember earlier I said that when Native Americans from New England left, they went to Michigan. Well, now they're going to be removed from Michigan and sent to Oklahoma. Next couple of states that have the largest numbers are Mississippi and Alabama. We kind of expect those states, right, in that deep south area with all the land and the farming. Tennessee has about 1,000. Now, this makes up 105,000 Native Americans that are removed from their land. This right here is Principal Chief John Ross. Just like the United States has a president, Cherokee Nation has a principal chief. The principal chief is the only one that is allowed to have any sort of treaty with America. So he goes to Jackson to try to sign a treaty. He offers Jackson a deal. He says, we'll give you all of the land for $20 million. We want the military to go with us along the way to keep us safe and protect us. And we want you to provide food and clothing along the way as well. But like I said, Jackson's the only president that has paid off our nation's debt. He's not going to pay $20 million, put us back in debt to take land that he knows he could just take if he wanted to. So he says no. Then we get Major Ridge. Major Ridge fought alongside Andrew Jackson. They're pretty good friends. He thinks maybe he can make a deal with them. So he goes to Jackson. He offers him this kind of same deal. You can have all of the land for $5 million. We want the military to go with us to protect us. We want you to provide food and clothing. And when we get there, we want you to show us how to farm the land, right? It's new soil. It's new climate. They don't know how to do that. And their whole livelihood depends on it. So Jackson's faced with paying $20 million or $5 million. And it's a pretty quick, easy decision for Jackson. He pays the $5 million, and we get the Treaty of Nui Chota. There's a few things to know about this treaty. One, it gives Cherokee Nation two years to gather all the food and all the clothing that they need um, for the journey. And two, and this is how this is still relevant today, the Treaty of Nui Chota actually gives a delegate at, uh, for Cherokee Nation in the House of Representatives. So it acts as kind of a territory, like Puerto Rico, Guam, they have a delegate, but they don't necessarily have voting powers in the House. Um, but the language in the treaty says that they can have that delegate when Congress is ready. And in September of 2019, Cherokee Nation actually got their first delegate in the House of Representatives. So 183 years later, this treaty is still taking effect. Congress is finally ready and Cherokee Nation gets their first delegate. Another thing to keep in mind, this is 1836. At the end of two years, it's 1838, and Jackson's not president anymore. So this doesn't really fall on him. Uh, Martin Van Buren, who will secede Jackson, he kind of takes a lot of the flack for that. But like I said, this does give uh, Cherokee Nation two years to gather everything they need for the journey. But Cherokee Nation didn't think that this was a legal treaty because it wasn't signed by the principal chief. So they didn't take the two years to gather everything. And at the end of the two years, this is what it looks like. A Georgia volunteer says, I fought through the Civil War and have seen men shot to pieces and slaughtered by thousands. But the Cherokee removal was the cruelest I ever saw. This man went and forced people out of their homes and sent them west. Years later, he fights in the Civil War, the bloodiest war in American history, and still, he thinks Cherokee removal was even worse. We put this in here to show you that this isn't just a casual walk west to Oklahoma. It's devastating. It's basically a slaughter for Cherokee Nation. This image here was published in the 1900s. It's an artist's rendition of the Trail of Tears. Uh, now, there's a few things to keep in mind about this. Um, unfortunately, it has a lot of historical inaccuracies. These covered wagons, while 
they did have covered wagons along the journey. They're mostly going to be for supplies and for sick people. Uh, the Native Americans are going to have to walk on foot for that whole way. They don't get to ride in wagons. They're not going to have these blankets and jackets because, like I said, they didn't take those two years to prepare. The military tries to provide clothing and blankets along the way, but I showed you those numbers, right? 105,000 people is really hard to supply blankets for, so they didn't have enough for everybody. And this man probably would not be holding a rifle. The army is not going to give weapons to all of the Native Americans because they would fear rebellion. Um, so those are a few historical inaccuracies about this picture. And truthfully, the numbers are going to be much higher. There's going to be a lot more pic people in this picture than you actually see. But this is what the map of the journey looks like for each of those five major nations in the Southeast, as well as those Native Americans in Michigan. There's a few things I like to point out about this. One, you see how far Seminole Nation is from Creek Nation? Do you think the average person in Seminole Nation and the average person in Creek Nation are going to know each other? If I lived in Seminole Nation and you lived in Creek Nation, besides this web conference, which they didn't have back then, there would probably be no communication between them. So keep that in mind for when we get to Oklahoma. Choctaw and Chickasaw down here in Mississippi are combined together, but there's a lot of conflict between these two. So keep that in mind as well for Oklahoma. Then this graph on the right, I like to use this to show you Cherokee Nation has 12,000 people removed from their homes and sent west. This is not an insignificant number, right? 12,000 people is still a lot. But the Choctaws have even more, and the Creeks have the most. But when we talk about Indian removal, we really only talk about Cherokee Nation. Even the term Trail of Tears, we always kind of associate those two, right? When we talk about Indian removal, we always talk about the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears is specific to Cherokee Nation. Each nation is going to have their own term for the journey. Some call it the Trail of Weeping, the Trail of Sorrow, or even the Trail of Death. But Cherokee Nation is the only nation that will call it the Trail of Tears. So given that information, we never really talk about the Choctaws or the Creeks and their removal process. But that's because Cherokee Nation, they had assimilated a lot more to white culture. So their documents are written in English. They also negotiated a lot more with white America, so there's a lot more documentation between them. The problem with some of these nations is that they didn't actually have a written language. So it's really hard to keep up with people's history and with people's um, journeys when they aren't able to write it down. We're relying on them passing it down orally from generation to generation, and that becomes very difficult for historians to study. So why was it called the Trail of Tears? Even before the trail starts, these people are facing a lot of disease because once they were removed from their home, they're put in internment camps and disease spreads rapidly through those camps. So a lot of people will actually die even before the journey starts just because they're in those camps. They're also going to be facing starvation because while the military, the government provides money for the shops along the trail to provide food and shelter, a lot of those shops are keeping that money and not providing what they're supposed to. So these people are going to face a lot of starvation because of that. And also ex exhaustion, because it is not just a 20 minute walk from Florida to Oklahoma, right? They're walking for months on end and they're being exhausted. This graphic here shows you some of that as well. Each of these names are a different branch of Cherokee Nation. Again, these are specific to Cherokee Nation. You see the name? The month that they left, so August and September, it's going to be hot, right? It could be up to 100 degrees in the south during those months. They're not going to be taking blankets and jackets with them. But they're marching through January, February, and even March. So they're marching through the thick of winter. They might be in a couple feet of snow, and they don't have those blankets to protect them. 
Elijah Hicks actually comes right here through downtown Nashville. Uh, that's how here at Andrew Jackson's Hermitage, we're part of the National Park um, Historic Trail for the Trail of Tears. While we're not technically a national park ourselves, we are on that trail. Um, and then Hildebrand down here, he faces the most loss. He leaves almost a month after everybody else, but he gets there just a couple weeks after everybody else. And that's because when they get to Oklahoma, land is first come, first serve. If you get there first, you get best pick of the land, but it's all relative, right? Because it's still just one state. If you get there last, there might not be much room left. So he overworks his people. He faces the most death, 455 people from that one group die. This map here is specific to Cherokee Nation as well. That large green area you see goes all the way through Kentucky, down through South Carolina and Georgia. That's what Cherokee Nation looked like before European settlement in the New World. Today, they've got the reservation in Oklahoma where they were sent, and there's a small reservation in North Carolina. Uh, there is a group of Cherokee people that fled up into the, mount the mountains of North Carolina. They were able to survive the removal process, and that's where Cherokee, North Carolina comes from today. There's still a reservation up there now. This shows you that these people are not only facing a great loss of life, they're facing an even greater loss of land. Once they get to Oklahoma, they're going to be overcrowded. They're going to face even more starvation because it's hard to farm the land when it's overrun with people. You're, you're cramming five or more major nations into one state. They don't have room to farm or even really move around at all. And this is what Oklahoma looks like when they get there. Cherokee Nation had assimilated more, they had negotiated more with white America, so they get the best pick of the land. They get that corner up there all to themselves and they get an outlet as well. Creek and Seminole Nation, remember I showed you how far apart they are? Well, now they need to learn how to work together. They need to learn each other's ways of life and each other's cultures so they can live in the same spot. The Choctaw and the Chickasaw down here in the south, like I said, like I showed you, they were connected to each other. They were adjacent with each other in uh, Mississippi. That conflict that they had for centuries doesn't end in Oklahoma. It actually gets even worse because these five nations are fighting over the land and conflict is going to arise more than ever. Not to mention, there were already Native Americans that were living in Oklahoma when they arrived. This wasn't vacant land. The government takes the land from tribes that are already living in Oklahoma and gives them to the tribes that they sent west. We end with this quote, Maya Angelou says, history despite its wrenching pain cannot be unlived and if faced with courage need not be lived again. We end with this because I understand that this is a really heavy topic. And as you all learn the nuances of it, as you learn more details about it, it really kind of only gets worse. I've been studying it for a while. It doesn't get any easier for me, but it is very important because if we learn from our past, if we face it with courage, we don't need to live it again. But if we forget about our past, if we brush it off and pretend it doesn't happen, it's only going to repeat itself. So that's why I'm glad you all are here joining us today. If you have any questions, uh, we've got about 20 minutes. I ended a little bit early this time. Um, Please feel free to stick around, ask any questions you have, either through the chat or uh, through the microphone as well. I'll be here until, um, or I guess for the next 20 minutes until this is over. We have a question from Eugene Ware. You got to push the button. Uh, why didn't the um, trail of tears, what happens if it never existed? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. What happens if the trail of tears never existed? What happens if the Trail of Tears never existed? That's a really good question. What would the nation look like today? Um, I think 
there probably would still be a lot of conflict. Um, and for one, a lot of people argue that um, Native Americans might not have survived all of that conflict, right? So they might have lost even more life um, if, if that didn't happen. Looks like uh, homeschool Alex has a question. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, um, what happened to the tribes that lived in Oklahoma before the, um, the Trail of Tears? So what happens to the tribes that already were living in Oklahoma? That's a great question. Um, they're just going to have to learn how to either share that land or fight for the land, or they might leave as well. Some, some would kind of leave a little bit more west. Um, there's a because you're cramming so many people in Oklahoma, if they went a little bit further west, there's more land that opens up for them. So some might do that as well. Uh, Big Pine says, why was there a secret treaty which was signed by some of the Cherokee, which they agreed to be moved? Um, Cherokee Nation knows that the government ultimately is going to take their land if they don't sign a treaty. So if they sign it kind of on mutual terms, it's going to kind of be a better end uh, for everybody. So. Uh, Major Ridge, knowing Andrew Jackson personally, decides that he probably has the best pull with him, so he tries to get that treaty signed. Unfortunately, it wasn't really a legal treaty because it wasn't signed by the principal chief, uh, which causes even more conflict at the end. How about Paradise Elementary? Did the U.S. government try to do anything to help the Native Americans when they were starving or became ill? So they are going to have the military there to treat some of those illnesses. Unfortunately, back then, medical expertise was not very high, especially when you're, you know, in the middle of nowhere on a trail. Um, sanitation, things like that are going to kind of make it worse. So even if they were trying to treat some of those illnesses, most of the time they couldn't. Great question, though. South Creek. Okay. Um, did the natives ever have to get moved out of Oklahoma? And if they did, where were they moved after that? Great question. Um, and we get that question a lot. So as we're expand expanding more west, um, because manifest destiny, right? Our nation wants to be from ocean to ocean. As we expand more west, there's actually a large boom or an influx of, of people moving to Oklahoma. The government's going to talk about removing those Native Americans from Oklahoma and sending them further west. But ultimately, the government decides that that's not really a good answer. Because if we keep moving them further west, eventually they're going to hit the ocean and they can't go anywhere else. So they decided to stop moving them west um, and kind of figure out the land that way. Um, some of them were still uh, kind of relocated in that process, but not the way that we see it here. Um, but yeah, great question. Uh, what will happen to the five civilized tribes when white farmers try to move west? Yeah, so that I hope that answered your question, uh, Bullock. Bullet Lick. Uh, I, um, they kind of agree to, to share that land or uh, voluntarily move. How about Alfred Elementary? What is the Cherokee like today? There's still a Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. Um, they are uh considered their own sovereign nation so they don't have to necessarily follow any of the united states laws they get to come up with their own laws they even have their own license plates so they don't if if somebody registers their card oklahoma uh, or in a cherokee nation they don't have oklahoma plates they have cherokee nation license plates uh which is pretty cool all right south creek you got two people so we'll go ahead and hear both of those people um, is the Trail of Tears still there, or is it, or has it been like taken down? The National Park uh, Service has actually taken the, the Trail of Tears, and they've turned it into a National Historic Route. Uh, so that goes right through downtown Nashville, uh, with Elijah Hicks's uh, group coming through Nashville. So that's what we at the Hermitage are part of that trail. Uh, we're one of the stops on that. Uh, the Trail of Tears National Trail. So if you come to Nashville today, as you're driving down the street, you'll see giant signs that say Trail of Tears National uh, Historic Route. Yeah, still stands. All right. 
why Oklahoma? Why didn't they do go more north or more south? Just why Oklahoma? That's a great question. Why Oklahoma? Um, we've got all of that territory. Um, and I'm not really sure why Oklahoma was, was it. Um, but Oklahoma, actually, the term Oklahoma means home of the red. Uh, so that was named in response to the Indian removal. Um, but that's that's a great question. Yeah, I'm not really sure why they chose that area. Okay. We'll do one more from South Creek. So did we just go around the Native Americans or what did we do with them when we were going more west? So the areas where they were placed in Oklahoma become um, their own sovereign nation. So as white settlers are moving to Oklahoma, they have to settle around those nations. They're not allowed to kind of invade those sovereign nations. So yeah, they, they just move around them. How about Paradise Elementary? You've been staying in there for a while. Um, so since the, the Native Americans, since they went from Mississippi uh, all the way to Oklahoma, would would they would it be in the like summer or would it go like from months into like the uh, winter? So they would leave in the summer in August and September. They would be marching all the way through the winter. Um, so they would they would be marching through that snow, uh, especially as you get more kind of mid state, it gets a little bit colder. Um, so yeah, they're going to be marching through that. Alfred Elementary. Would this happen again in the future? That is a really good question. Will this happen again in the future? Um, the Indian Removal Act is actually still in place today. It's never been nullified. So there is always the chance that this could happen again. Uh, Any time that that has kind of come up, the federal government has stepped in and changed it. The last time it showed up was actually uh, just a few years ago uh, when that Dakota pipeline was going through uh, Sioux Nation. The government discussed whether they were going to use the Indian Removal Act or uh, eminent domain in order to take that land. Ultimately, I guess they thought that the less politically charged way would be eminent domain. Um, they didn't use the Indian Removal Act, but it is still in place. So um, that's why this is still relevant today, right? It still, still has the option of, of, of happening again. How about Eugene Ware? You've been sitting there patiently. Um, so did the people, did the Indians that died on the Oregon Trail, uh, on the Trail of Tears, did any of them get buried or did they all just? Their families might try to bury them along the trail. Um, if they died, if they were actually dead, then their families would, would try to bury them and give them that proper ceremony if they could. Uh, but sometimes if somebody was really sick and they were dying, they would just be left there. Um, so they might not have that opportunity. Yeah. Paradise Elementary. What is the Cherokee population number today? That is a really good question. I'm not sure what the Cherokee population number is today, uh, but I bet you guys can look it up in your class and find that out. Um, I'm sure that would be pretty easy to find. Great question, though. Paradise Elementary again. Why did the U.S. government make, government make a treaty? They were just going to put them off of the land. Why did they make... I think what you're asking is, why did they sign the treaty and pay for it if they could have forced them off the land? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Um, it's really just to kind of make it more peaceful, right? Because if they go in, in in there and they try to steal the land by force, it's going to cause a lot more conflict and ultimately will probably lead to a war. Uh, if they sign a treaty and they do it fairly, it it's a little more peaceful and it makes the government look a little bit better as well. Stephanie Homeschool Group. When did the first group leave? When did the first group leave? Um, I don't really know when the first official group left because it's going to look different for each nation, right? Because each nation, and this is what's important to understand about the Indian Removal Act, the act itself doesn't remove any Native Americans from their land. 
but it gives the federal government power to write a treaty to remove them from their land. Um, so each nation has to sign their own treaty for that. Um, so as far as the Trail of Tears, uh, what we've been talking about, you see that map, um, that graphic there. The first group's going to be um, Herr Conrad in August. But for other nations, it might be earlier than that. Good question, though. Alfred Elementary. How do the nations get along now? The nations get along fairly well now. Um, they, they've they kind of, I think they've been through a lot together um, with this Indian removal. So there's, um, there's kind of some mutual agreement there, uh, a lot more peace. Um, but they might have a few kind of peaceful um, conflicts that arise as well. Any last questions? We've got about seven minutes left. Y'all have been asking some great questions. Thank you so much. I think that um, homeschool Alex has a question. Okay. Alex? I, I can't see the hand raise, so I'm sorry if you oh, kind of okay. do that, that hand raise click and I don't see it. So yes, Alex homeschool. Um, yeah, so I was wondering what is what was the first act that since they only since the Cherokee Nation only got their delegate September, what was the first act that the delegate um, passed? Or um, they haven't really been able to yet. Um, so the process that kind of happened to to give them that delegate, and this is a great question uh, to kind of go into. So in August. Um, Cherokee Nation got a new principal chief because they still run off that same system of government. They still have a principal chief today. So they got a new principal chief and that principal chief's first act was to appoint the delegate to the House of Representatives. And it only took them about a month to do that, uh, which is great. Um, another really cool thing is that the first delegate in the House uh, from Cherokee Nation is actually a female. Um, and this is really cool because one, it kind of knocks down those walls, right? But also Cherokee Nation, uh, as far as inheritance and kind of familial ties, it follows the mother's line. So to appoint a woman is, is really kind of just right, up, right alongside um, what they believe in, right? So the principal chief is always a man, but um, a lot of that power and a lot of that wealth follows the mother's line, which uh, is really neat to have a female delegate because of that. But yeah, they haven't had much time to um, to pass any acts in the house yet. So I'm interested to see what she's able to do. We got about five minutes left. If y'all are about to head out, uh, if you don't have any questions, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really glad that you all were able to, to um, take part in this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Patrick, for all your knowledge and expertise. And for everyone that came, we really appreciate you joining us. Hopefully we'll be able to, you'll be able to join us again. Um, have a great day, everybody. All right. Bye, y'all. Thank you.